Hello, Saints. Welcome to Wednesday Prayer and Bible Study. Uh, today is actually two holidays for some people. Uh, one of them is Valentine's Day. People are celebrating. And another one is Ash Wednesday that people celebrate. But over here, you know, we want to do what the Lord has told us to do. And we, even though we as children of God, a lot of times we get caught up in uh, worldly holidays, like Valentine's Day is a traditional holiday, and Ash Wednesday, actually Ash Wednesday is not found in the Bible, it actually came about when um, Constantine was emperor and he integrated uh, the church into, he wanted everybody to be a Christian. So a lot of pagan traditions came into the church and that's how actually Acts Wednesday got into the church. But I wanna ask you a question today. Have you ever prayed to God for something and you didn't see no manifestations of anything happening once you prayed to God. Well, if that's the case, what we're going to be talking about here going up until Easter is prayer. And what we want to talk about is why we should pray, what is prayer, <laughs> and what we want to do is ask you two questions. Who do you pray to? That can determine on whether your prayer is answered or not, and how do we pray? And what we want to do, it's going to take a while to answer these two questions. Who do we pray to and how do we pray? And we're going to spend some time on this because a lot of saints will come to you and ask you to pray for them. And there's nothing wrong with that, but the Bible says that if you are afflicted in something, James talks about that, that you should pray for yourself. And he says if you're sick, you know, if you're, you can't pray for yourself, that you can call for the elders of the church and they'll pray the prayer of faith over you, anointing you with oil. But what we want to zero in is you. how you should be praying and who you should be praying to. And I am convinced that a lot of prayers are not answered because we don't know who we are praying to. You know, there's two things that determine your doctrine. One is what the Bible says, and then you have what men are saying. What we want to do over here, going up into Easter, we want to tell you what God is saying about prayer. Because a lot of times we are praying just useless prayers and they're not going anywhere, but just wherever you're at, they're just in that surrounding where you're at. But we want to pray and have our prayers answered over here. And I want to use a verse here in um, Isaiah 56, 7. It says, All those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. So God wants you to be joyful in his house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. He wants 
your specific request and all had to be accepted. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all people. Now, this was prophesied that his house, God's house, should be a house of prayer for all people. We call God's house these different buildings that we meet in, you know, Sunday and Wednesday for prayer meeting. And over here, this is one of God's house of prayer. But we want the place where you meet at for house of prayer and your own house to be a house of prayer because your own house should be a house of prayer too. Now, when you look at what Jesus says, that's what we want to go by. Jesus is our Lord and Savior, right? So we want to go by what Jesus said. Go with me to um, Matthew, the 21st chapter. Let's start there. And I want to give you another verse because this is what Jesus quoted the same scripture in Isaiah. What Isaiah said here in 56, 7, Jesus quoted the same verse in uh, Matthew, the 21st chapter. He actually is recorded in um, Mark and Luke also. And then it talks some about it in the book of John. But here in the 21st chapter of Matthew, let's start at the 12th verse. It says, And Jesus entered the temple grounds and drove out with force all, the, all who were selling, buying and selling birds and animals for sacrifice in the temple area, and he turned over the tables of the money changers who made a profit as changing foreign money for the temple coinage. And the chairs of those who were selling doves for sacrifice. Jesus said to them, it is written in scripture, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made but you are making it a robber's den. That's why we need to be talking to God. Because if, if we're in, been making God's house a robber's den, or a den of faith, some translations put it, and we're not making God's house a house of prayer, that could be one of the biggest answers why your prayers are not being answered. It's not what Jesus, when he turned over the tables of the money changers and all of that, it wasn't so much of what they were actually doing. It was that they had turned God's house into a place of merchandise. And a lot of our different churches, we have turned them into a place of merchandise. You know, what we're going to get out of that church more so than making it a house of prayer. You know, sanctifying it and setting it aside for God's use. So, you know, you ask yourself, well, why pray, Brother Carter? Jesus, go with me to, um, well, actually, and Luke 18.1, this is what Jesus said. Now Jesus was telling the disciples a parable to make the point that at all times you ought to pray and not to give up or lose heart. So Jesus is saying that we should always pray. Jesus was a prayer, right? Jesus one time in the uh, gospel accounts, he prayed all night before he chose the 12 apostles. Jesus, when you start looking at the gospel accounts of Jesus, Jesus was always in prayer. Amen. Now, here's one scripture. Go with me to uh, 1 Timothy because we're asking the question, well, why pray? Why, why do we have to pray? 
I mean, I can just do whatever I want to do. True, you can. You can do whatever you want to do. But here in uh, 1 Timothy, the second chapter, we're asking the question, why pray? It says here in 1 Timothy, the second chapter, the first verse, first of all, now this is Paul writing by the Spirit of God. This is an epistle. And so what Jesus is saying in the gospel accounts about prayer, it goes into all the epistles. And actually, James talks about prayer in the uh, fifth chapter of James, too. It says, first of all, then I urge that petitions, specific requests, prayers, intercessions, prayers for others, and thanksgiving be also worked on behalf of all people. So you are praying specific requests. That's why a lot of prayers are not answered because they're not specific requests. A lot of people just throw everything up when they're praying to God and they don't have no specific requests. It says here, for kings and all who are in positions of high authority so that we may live a peaceful and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. So we need to pray for people in high authority because there is a spiritual battle going on and what the devil does, he uses people in high authority because what decisions they make can determine the outcome for a lot of people. So we need to pray for them. And he says, this kind of praying is good and acceptable and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. So just <laughs> praise God. It says, who wishes all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge and recognition of the divine truth. For there is only one God and only one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom, a substitutory sacrifice to atone for all to testify to testimony to be given at the right and proper time. And when you jump down to verse 8, it says, Therefore I want, therefore I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger and disputing and quarreling or doubt in their mind. So why we should pray is for people in authority. We should pray for specific requests. We should pray for people, and mainly we should pray that they would be saved and come to the knowledge that there is what? It says there is only one God. See, that's why, you know, a lot of people, they are praying to God, but what God are they praying to? We're going to get into this. It says there is only one God and only one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus. The God that we pray to over here is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God that David the king prayed to. The God of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's who we pray to. We pray to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you are not praying to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, your prayers will not be answered. That's why a lot of people's prayers are not answered because they're not praying to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what is prayer? Let's answer that question because a lot of people, they really, I don't think they know what prayer is. But we're going to use just a simple 
phrase, and this simple phrase is going to come up over and over as we talk about uh, what prayer is and how to pray and who do we pray to and you know when you get into how to pray then that's going to really help you. It says in uh, Psalms the fifth chapter the third verse it says in the morning O Lord. See everybody knows who the Lord is. You will hear my voice in the morning I will prepare a prayer and a sacrifice and you and watch and wait for you to speak to my heart. So the easiest and plainest definition of what prayer is is communion with God. Prayer is communion with God. It is fellowship with God. That means that you are presenting your specific requests to God and you're waiting and watching in your heart for an answer from God. It's a two-way conversation. You know, when you fellowship with somebody, say like you go out with one of your friends or something, you, you're talking to him and that he's talking to you. But when you first meet up, that conversation could be about all different kinds of things. So it's the same way with God. When you are praying to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you want to make your specific request known to God. And then you are waiting in prayer to hear what God is saying to your heart. Because that's where he's going to speak to you. Because God is a spirit. And those that worship God must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And we know that we are spiritual beings. And Peter talks about this, the hidden man of the heart. That's, that's where God is going to talk to you in your heart. Amen. Because another scripture says that the spirit of man is a lamp unto the Lord. Amen. And that's who... We wait to hear from God because when you're praying to God, you can't just rush in and lay down all your requests and all that stuff and then you just jump up and you don't wait to hear back from God and then what you do, you presumptuously believe that you are heard from God when you really haven't heard from God. These thoughts, some of these thoughts coming to your mind are not from God and you don't take enough time to sit down and look at your Bible and read your Bible when these thoughts hit your mind to see if they're really from God. The enemy can give you thoughts. Amen. And it's once we understand that why we're supposed to pray and what prayer is, your prayer life will increase in the house of God and also in your house. We're, we're going to learn how to be some praying people and we're going to learn how to get our specific requests answered from God. We're, we're, we're you know, we're over here. We're going to concentrate on this. We're going, we're going to pray the way God has told us to pray. We're going to pray to who the Bible tells us to pray to. Because like I told you, there's two people that you can listen to. You can listen to what God is saying or you can listen to what man is saying. I'm going to listen to what God is telling me about what prayer is. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to bag it up with his scriptures because uh, this is what Jesus did. He would always bag up what God said. He would only say what he heard his father say. 
That's what we need to start doing is only say what God is saying. And, you know, all the tradition of men, how they, like I was saying, they, they just work this way into the church that we celebrate Ash Wednesday. There's nothing wrong with that. You can do it if you want to. But once you start really knowing who God is, that's the key. Once you really know who God is, that God is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that he's the only one God, and there's only one way to get to God, is through Jesus Christ, then your whole prayer life will change, your whole life will change. I mean, once you really get this into your spirit. Now, a lot of times what helps me is when I want to know what something is, I find out what it is not. And that helps you to understand what it is. In this case, we want we are asking the question, what is prayer? And we said it is communion with God, but what is not prayer? Go with me to Luke the 18th chapter. And let's look at what prayer is not. This will help you a great deal because if you know what prayer is not, you will stop doing praying that way. <laughs> Amen. Here in the 18th chapter, go with me down to uh, the ninth verse. It says, He also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves and were confident that they were righteous, posing outward as upright and in right standing with God, and who viewed others with contentment. He said, two men went up into the temple enclosure to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. So we know by studying the Bible, the Gospel accounts of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that the Pharisees were the, the religious leaders of that time. They were Jewish people. Jesus was a Jew himself. And they were the ones that, you know, taught the scriptures, and they were the ones that were in the synagogues of the Jews. And they were very religious. Like today, we have people that are pastors of churches. Some call themselves bishops. Some actually call themselves the Pope. Bishops and all of that. These are the religious people of our time. And these are the people that should be telling us what not to do in prayer. So let's see what Jesus says here. Because if you really want to know what prayer is, and, and, and you have to hear what Jesus has to say. But he says there was a Pharisee and a tax collector. Now a tax collector was a, a um, Jewish man that was always after the money. Now, these tax collectors, they like to drink, they like to party, they like to have a good time. They wasn't what you would call a religious person. They're kind of like people of the world today. They like, you know, entertainment. They like to party. They like to, um, you know, do all these wild things. And, you know, they're not really caught up in any type of religious things, but a lot of them, you know, they do go to church, but they are just like worldly, carnal-minded Christians today. And it tells us here, in 11 verse, the Pharisee stood and began praying to himself, 
in a self-righteous way saying, God, I thank you that I am not like the rest of men, swindlers, unjust, dishonest, adulterers, and even like this tax collector, I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. Now, you notice that it, Jesus is telling us that this Pharisee was praying to himself. So he wasn't praying to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was praying to himself. And see, we have to watch that, especially as ministers, that when we are praying, we shouldn't be praying, Lord, we pray that you would have these people to come to church every Sunday, that you would have these people to pay their tithes. That's, that's like praying over God's shoulder. That's, what we, that's not prayer. When you're praying to yourself, and it's about I, 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 that's not prayer. Now, when you look over here in Luke, the 18th chapter, it says, uh, <laughs> in the 13th verse, the tax collector standing at a distance would not even raise his eyes toward heaven, but was striking, striking his chest in humility and repentance, saying, God, be merciful and grateful to me, the especially wicked sinner that I am. See, a lot of us know that there is no just man on the earth and that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We know that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And when you, when you humble yourself to God, Amen. He will exalt you. And this is what it tells us. Jesus, this is Jesus talking to us. He said, I tell you, this man went to his house justified, forgiven of the guilt of his sins and placed in right standing with God, rather than the other man, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself Forsaking self-righteous pride will be exalted. So that's one thing that we should do in prayer. We should humble ourselves before God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We should humble ourselves. We should come to God in prayer, humbling ourselves, confessing our wrongdoings, our shortcomings, and all of that. And recognizing that it's by His grace that we have been forgiven of our sins. It's, when you humble yourself before God, He can pick you up. But if you come to God arrogant and pride, proud, self-righteous pride, like you haven't did nothing, and you you you're talking, you're praying to God, and and you're not really praying to God. You're, you're talking about other people. Just like this tax collector did. He said, he even said, I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. He said, he's not like this tax collector. He was actually in more were shaped in this tax collector. Even though he was a religious leader, just like today a lot of us are religious leaders are in worse shape than a, a normal person just coming humbly before God. Whether they're coming to church, they're coming to church humbly. They're humbling themselves before God. They're, they're listening to their, their heart, what God is saying to them. And they're praying a, a prayer for God to be merciful to, unto them because they know that God is merciful, He is gracious, He is loving kindness, and they know that they haven't did everything that they were supposed to be doing. When you think that you will have arrived before God, you haven't. That's just pride. That's self-righteousness. 
You can't pray in self-righteousness. Amen. You have to pray humbly. Let's look at something else here. Go with me to Matthew 6 chapter. What prayer is not. So we know over here that what prayer is not is not praying to yourself. Amen. Over here in Matthew the 6th chapter. Let's see what the Lord had to say over here. In Matthew the 6th chapter, let's start at the uh, 15th verse. It says, also when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray publicly standing in the synagogue and on the corners of the street, so that they may be seen by men. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, they already have their reward. So he said, stop doing that. That's not prayer. When you are praying publicly and you want to be seen by men, and especially when you're praying publicly and you're talking, you're praying to yourself, that's, that's not prayer. It says, but when you pray, Go into your most private room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you openly. So he's saying when you pray, get off to yourself. Amen? Especially if you're praying in, in your house, because you're, we're going to turn your house into a house of prayer. That's... That's one place where we should really have a prayer room in our house. We should be able to get away from all the distractions in our house, the TV, the radios, the social media, the phone. I mean, just turn off everything. And, and you go into this private room. It could be your bedroom. It could be your study. But it's a place that you are talking to just God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are praying to him in secret. You are making your petitions known to him. And you're, you're waiting in your heart to see what he's going to say back to you. That's what God wants us to do. He, he ain't concerned about us praying in public and making a big prayer, a long prayer in public for the people to see. It says also in the seventh verse, and when you pray, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. So he said, when you pray, don't have a memorized prayer. <laughs> you know, or a chant. You're chanting the same thing over and over. He said, don't, don't use vain repetition. Don't, don't do that. And um, you know, a lot of times I have heard prayers that um, people are, their prayer is rebuking the devil and, and rebuking what the devil is doing. At any time, you shouldn't be praying about slaying the devil and rebuking it. The devil is a defeated uh, um, creature to start with. And also, Jesus has already defeated the devil. So when, you, when, you pr when you're praying, we shouldn't use these vain repetitions, you know, different other phrases that maybe we heard somebody say and we we're using them same meaningless repetitions and we're using many words, you know, quoting scripture and, and that's not prayer. It tells us here, 
It says in that eighth verse of that sixth chapter says, So do not be like them, praying as they do. For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So he said, don't use vain repetition. You know, one thing, praying is not counting beads either. Or spinning a wheel. That's not prayer. Prayer is praying to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's get a little bit more on this. Who do we pray to? You know, a lot of people don't really even know who they're praying to. And a lot of people are praying to many different gods, which will not, never answer their prayer. You have to know who do we pray to. Go with me to uh, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, the fifth chapter. It tells us, this is when this first generation of people uh, came out of Egypt and actually Moses was uh, going over the Ten Commandments, repeating them to him again. And when you get down here to the ninth verse, it says, You shall not worship. Let's just see here. Am I got that right? Oh, let's go to the sixth verse. Let's get put it in. You know, I, 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 you know, when you get excited, you want to jump ahead, but you know, I have to slow it down. I have to slow myself down. Duke around me five, chapter five to six verse. It says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. So God is telling us that we should be praying to him, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying that we shouldn't have any other God before him. That means that you shouldn't be praying to a saint. That means that you shouldn't be praying to Mary, the mother of Jesus. I know I'm going to cross some lines, but you know, you need to know the truth. And see, once you know the truth, the truth will make you free. And this is why a lot of people's prayers are not answered because they're not praying to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying here, you shall not worship them nor serve them. That's the ninth verse. Well, let's, let's just bag it up. It says, you shall have no other gods before me you shall not make yourself any idols as an object to worship or any likeness form manifestation of what is in heaven above or what is on the earth beneath or what is in the water underneath the earth. So he's saying that we shouldn't pray to a pitcher. A picture is an idol. We shouldn't pray to a statue. We're talking about who do we pray to? We pray to God the Father. This is how you get your prayers answered. You pray to God the Father. And how do we... Go with me to John 16. We're going to bring something to your remembrance here. Because a lot of people say, well, Brother Carr, I pay, you know, I had this, this, this private room you were talking about. And I got this picture of the mother of Jesus, and I pray to her. And another person might say, well, I do, have, I do have this prayer room that I go to, but there is a statue in there, and I pray to that statue. The Bible says here that you shall have no other gods before me. 
So how do we really pray? Go with me to John the 16th chapter. The 23rd verse. It says, In that day you will not need to ask me about anything. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, Whatever you ask the Father in my name as my representatives, I will do. So this is Jesus telling us here, in that day, that's today, we, you will not need to ask me about anything. So a lot of people say, well, I pray to Jesus. Well, that's not what he's saying here. He's saying that you should pray. Let's, let's read the next verse. He says um, in verse 24, Until now you have not asked the Father for anything in my name, but now ask and keep on asking and you will receive that your joy may be filled. So he said when we pray to the Father, these are that we should pray in Jesus' name. That's the guy that who we should pray for is God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when you go into your prayer closet and you get ready to pray, you shouldn't be praying to a statue. You shouldn't be praying to a picture. You shouldn't be praying to none of the saints. You should be praying to the Father in Jesus' name. That's how you get your prayers answered when you pray to the Father in Jesus' name. A lot of people may haven't had their prayers answered because they're not praying to God. God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the only God, that's who we pray to. We pray to the only God. We don't pray to false gods. We don't pray to statues. We don't pray to none of that kind of stuff. We pray to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you get your prayers heard. A lot of people say, well, brother, I've been praying to God for years, and he's answered some of my prayers. Well, actually, do you really know that God has answered your prayers? The God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ? Or is just that God has had mercy on you because you have been ignorantly praying in vain, and what God has done he has had mercy on you because he did that in the book of Acts with uh, Centurion, with that Centurion servant in Acts the 10th chapter. He was praying to God, but he didn't really understand who God was, but he knew that he was the God of the Jewish people. <laughs> and he, he realized that that was the true and living God he had enough that he knew that he had to pray to God. He wasn't praying in Jesus' name at that time. He didn't know that he was supposed to pray in Jesus' name, but as he was praying and making his petitions, you know, to God, and actually what this uh, centurion soldier was doing, that he was actually giving the Jewish people money. He was very charitable. He was in his deeds that he was praying to God day and night. And that's what a lot of people do. They are ignorantly praying to God and what God does, he has mercy on them. In this case, with the centurion servant, he actually had an angel appear to him and told him to send to Peter so that he could get a more perfect understanding of who God was and how to be saved and how to receive the Holy Spirit. Amen? So, we're going to work on this. Let's go back here, give you one more verse. Go to with me to, um, well, let's just stop there. Because we don't want to, you know, give you too much. We want to give you enough that you can start your prayer life. You can start praying to God in Jesus' name 
first of all, and stop praying to any idol or any statue or any picture or using vain repetitions or praying to yourself or praying about what other people should do, that you can pray to your to God the Father and start getting your prayers answered. And we're gonna be asking how do we pray and lessons to come, but if you know why you should pray and what prayer is, prayer is communion with God, and who do we pray to? That is a tremendous amount of knowledge that you can use and start getting your prayers answered. Because when you talk to God, this fellowship, if you start this fellowship with God in prayer and, and you wait to see what he's going to speak to your heart, you'll be surprised what God is going to tell you. Have a good day. God bless you and keep you.